Welcome to the show, everybody. We have a very special guest for you, and that is TJ Boo. Hello, sir. How are we doing? Good, good. So uh, we have TJ on the show today because he's uh, very versed in, in the realm of uh, sports performance, uh, not just the fitness side, recovery side, nutrition side, every side, so to speak. And um, I'm very interested in getting some also like movement flow that you do. But real quick, TJ, you just kind of um, like how did you, you even kind of get into this vocation, so to speak, this job? Sure. Um, so I, when I was in high school, I was very fortunate. My first strength and conditioning coach um, it was Matt Ballas, who, if you know this SNC world at all, he is a very prominent collegiate strength and conditioning coach. Right now, I believe he is the football performance director at Notre Dame. Wow. Um, yeah, he he was at Florida, I think, with Urban Meyer. He goes back quite a ways. Man. He was in Mississippi State when Dak Prescott had his big year uh, wow. before he got drafted. So just very lucky because he was a he was a grad assistant at the time. Um, and I just I loved being in the weight room. I loved learning the technical stuff. Yeah. And from there uh, I went to college. I thought I might want to be in athletic training, mm-hmm. but I found that to be a little depressing because okay. you were constantly dealing with hurt dudes. Oh, right, right. Right. Whether it was somebody who had been hurt all the time and uh, was depressed about that, yeah. <laughs> or some kid who'd never been hurt before, and was, it was like the world was collapsing. And he it just, freaks him out. And- yeah. And so I started to dive a little bit more into um, training with people, which I found just to be more uplifting yeah. because it felt more accomplishing. Um, so I felt like I didn't, wasn't carrying the weight of people. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and it helps out so much. And, and, and if anybody doesn't know, uh, uh, we, uh, ran our school out from practice fit, which TJ runs, uh, the head trainer here. Sure. And, um, you o- always hear those weights of clanging. Uh, yeah. if not that just as much time spent on, uh, recovery movement and just movements in general you even have recovery days uh they do for people you kind of go on importance that because i mean you do train all the time lifting and things like that uh but you go into just as much import focus you do spend on that recovery absolutely um because as much as you wouldn't think it um some guys on twitter i follow are very good about this and putting it in this way and this is the best way i've ever heard it gains are not made in the weight room they are made when you are recovering so your training, you push yourself, you do all the, th- all the things you're supposed to, but you want to make sure you're doing everything you can, sleeping, eating, um, stretching, and make sure, making sure you're maintaining the ability to get to the angles that you need to get to in your mechanics. Yeah, that makes so much I mean, even, um, uh, who was it, uh, LeBron James, someone said how much money he spends on just the recovery side of things, not just, you know, the athleticism and, you know. Funny you mention him. So there was a, I can never find it. There was a Sports Illustrated article. If you remember back to um, when the Bulls were playing the Cavs and Derrick oh. Rose hit that bank shot yeah. to win the game, the walk-off. There was a, and, and LeBron's the perfect example of this, uh, there was a story of a guy who kind of followed what he did from the time that that game ended to the all the recovery work he did leading up into the next game when he ended up hitting a walk off oh, in really? the corner, a, a corner three to end the game. And the, it was 48 hours of plane ride, um, his hyperbaric chamber, you know, yeah. all of the stuff. And people forget or don't realize their bodies, their money. And yes. They put so much time into their bodies, especially chiropractic, massage, oh, yeah. all of that. That's that's amazing. I try to preach that to the guys too, especially I've, I've been doing jujitsu since 2004. And, uh, you know, there's there's that mindset, like go as much as you possibly can. Train smart, of course. And especially when, you, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, but like when I'm in my 20s, you just go and you just go, you just bite your teeth, you know, bite on your mouthpiece and go. But, you know, at some point that wears on you. <laughs> the overtraining of it and all that, right? No doubt. You, you'll you get through points where maybe, um, you know, and I find this a lot with people. Um, we, we train people. Um, they'll start coming in maybe one or two days a week. Then they want to start coming in three, four, five days a week. Or, you know, they're coming in four times a week. And then they're like, you know, I'm going to start running. And every time we talk about that, I'm like, you know, we're prepping for this stuff. We're, we're working through stuff. But you want to make sure you remember. Now you're adding load 
to your work, to your body, that comes at a cost somewhere. So you just want to make sure that either you're scheduling recovery days still, you're making, right. maintaining hydration, you're eating well. All those things have to kind of turn up a notch. Yeah. If you want to add more. To compensate for that extra. Right? Or even the nutrition. Like that's why sub, the key word is supplements. It's not diet. It's supplements. So, uh, you know, you can kind of go into that because if you're doing uh, unnatural things and pushing yourself, you also have to like improve these supplements uh, hone into eating, but so on and so forth. You go kind of in, into that. Sure. Your uh, supplements are, like you just said, just that. They supplement things. Um, the body wants to take things in in its natural state. So that's, you know, like whether nice. micronutrients, things like that, your body wants to ingest that via the nutrients that it comes from. It doesn't want to take it from a powder. Yeah. Um, you know, like even um, some vitamin D supplementation, you want to do that too. But you still want to get it naturally via exposure because vitamin D is something that the, the overdose, to overdose, you'd have to take so much of it. Right. But the only way you can overdose is by taking the supplement because your body synthesizes it. Right, right. So vitamin D doesn't just come in as vitamin D. Your body takes in sunlight and then synthesizes it. If vitamin D sensors or receptors are full, you don't need to synthesize sunlight. Right, or you see, here's people when they take like a multiple vitamin, and then next you know they're they're when they go pee, it's like bright yellow, and they're, they're all their money is going uh, through that. Unless you're like some of these other guys, uh, the Machida brothers, uh, they tend, you know where I'm going with that. Yeah, they yeah. tend to drink the urine the next yeah, yeah, <laughs> the next exactly. morning. Woo. Yeah, it's like even like you know when you talk about people who are trying to add protein in. Yeah. Um, where I used to work, uh, they would sell, they would make a sell protein powders, and you know the serving was three scoops, which was like 60 grams of protein. And oh, I'm like, man. they're not taking that in. You have to start with like, yeah. you can get to a point where you do that, but just like with the multivitamin, you know, you probably have to cut it in half and take it to get your body to absorb a just little absorb, bit of it. Right. And then, then you can start to take a full pill because then your body gets used to a certain amount and then it can start to absorb more. Same thing with protein. Like, you know, I have to a point where at times I can take 40 grams, but that's because I went through a phase of taking 20. Right. And then I would go to 30, and then I would go to 40. Well, it's the whole like homeostasis uh, concept, and, and, and that could like, slowly adapt. But if you stop doing the stimulus, it wants to go right back to what yeah. it was. Uh, now, let's say we take guys, uh, you know, guys that listen. There's not just jujitsu; It's all styles of grappling, all styles of martial arts. Um, let's say that you got that guy that's just training you know, all week. You know, what's what? Uh, let's go more in uh, the recovery or even preventative phase, so we're not overtraining. Because I know you do like whole days uh, and, and throughout the week sessions as well. Um, and I suppose, obviously, age group might have a more part to play as well. But what are kind of something like tips, guys listening, they can do if like, man, I'm just hitting it like five to six days a week of hard training. Sure, um, I would encourage you to warm up. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, um, some things that I would consider, um, there's a, you may not have the time for this. Um, there's a a certification process I went through called functional range conditioning, which is basically taking your body to its end range and conditioning the end ranges. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's very cool. People may not have the time for the actual process, but what you can do is what, um, a lot of people would call in our line of work, positional ISOs. So isometric holds you know, get to kind of your end range of maybe internal rotation at the shoulder and then do some isometric holds there as a warm up to try to keep yourself a little safer when somebody, you know, cranks your elbow or cranks your shoulder and takes you into an end range, you you know, your body is at least ready to tense up properly for it. Oh, that that makes so much more sense. Yeah. And and if you're like just cold going into it anyways, you know, everybody compares it to like, oh, the rubber band in the freezer concept. But it's true. You know, if someone's, uh, I say, like, if you go for a knee bar, uh, you know, you're going to feel the hamstring. If you go A to Z, it just pops. But it, uh, people get kind of funny with it when we drill. It's like, it's like a regular stretch at that point, if, uh, an assisted stretch. I always call it combat yoga. Uh, as, as someone's cranking a knee bar as a, just drilling, next you know, the guy's not tapping, not tapping, not tapping, because the hamstring's relaxing as if you were reaching for your toes. In real life, you go A to Z and it just pops. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's an important concept people don't uh, get behind. There's not enough focus on recovery. Like when you get done with the workout, like you, you should have a warm, warm up, like you said. Then you do your workout, right? Go into cool down. Can you go into like a cool down phase? Yeah, typically um, that'll be a time for some soft tissue work, I find. 
Um, I do some before for myself, but I'll do a lot of soft tissue work um, afterwards um, using, you know, various tools, lacrosse balls, tennis balls. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I call that there's there's lots of questions and debates about what actually that does, whether or not that breaks up tissue, so to speak, okay. in quotations, um, or whether that is stimulation for the area. And when you stimulate the area, then it's easier to get more access to that area, more access to muscles, gotcha. like access to diff deeper, you know, a range of motion in a stretch. Or um, and then from there, you know, if you have the time, you would want to be holding stretches for like two minutes. Oh, and, and yeah, nice long time. On nice it. long time to help your body After relax. After the workout. Correct. Yeah. To, to bring down your central nervous system, to let your body, your heart rate come down. Um, that, and part of, I'll go circle back a little bit to the positional isos. Mm -hmm. Part of what that stuff does is that revs up your nervous system. Oh, for the warm up. For your prep work. Okay. Because it gets your, it'll get everything, I would equate it to like a matchbox car. Like those okay. old school matchbox cars, pull it back, charge oh, yeah. it up and let it go. Yeah. That's kind of what the positional ISO stuff will do, that strength work, that warm-up strength work that's short, quick, um, and then you want something more relaxing post. At the end. Yeah. Yeah, it makes, yeah, the longer holds and things like that and mm -hmm. breathe. Yeah, and the other thing I want to go on too, um, especially with jiu-jitsu or any form of martial arts, really, you know, the, the importance of movement is so, so important. And um, I think, too, you have this uh, animal flow. I'd like you to go into that because... Especially the, the longer you do jujitsu, to improve your movement, uh, it number one, it improves your range of motion and it, uh, you less wear and tear as well. And also your jujitsu and martial art game look, looks and feels better as well. Can you kind of go into animal flow? What's that? Just movement in general. Sure. So animal flow is a um, body weight system. It's a movement system. So hopefully, um, so a guy named Mike Fitch created it. Um, so hopefully I do, I do him some justice when I talk about this. Um, <laughs> So it's a ground-based movement, so kind of quadruped style, all four on the floor is the, would be kind of the easy way to describe it. What you get with that is you get a lot of feedback from the ground. Mm -hmm. Your hands, your feet are in contact with the ground. You're sending messages from your hands to your brain, and they're also going down to your feet. So you're connecting from your fingertips to your toe tips, um, which if you're doing something like grappling, and I would argue almost any sport, you need that. Oh, yeah. So everything from the ground, putting force into the ground, and then having it being executed somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, that's where you, like your power or change of direction, anything you need to do uh, stems from the ground. Right? Yeah. All that. Um, I mean, especially jujitsu, we're like on the ground. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's Animal flow is kind of like a, sorry, it's kind of like a hybrid of, um, I would call it like martial arts, floor style martial arts, floor mm -hmm. style gymnastics. And I would also like you can incorporate an incredibly power based yoga. Um, okay. So lots of deep ranges of motion, deep stretches. Um, and then at certain points, you can do everything isolated and separate little movements. Or as the flow part comes in, you can start to connect all of these movements together and create like long choreographed flows. Awesome. Where yeah. you move from. I mean, you can cover tons of space with those, yeah. And the key word there is flow. I mean, that's what we always try to practice in jiu-jitsu. I know guys that do uh, kung fu and taekwondo and karate, you know, you, at some point where you're going live, there, there's more of a flow to it. You're not so choppy, and and um, that promotes that heavily. And and not to mention, you know, like that couple with like recovery. That So the movement and recovery is such a, a not very focused upon thing. I, I, you see so often, like, guys would do a hard, you know, class, warm-up class, do a hard sparring round and zero cool down. There's no stretching going on. It's just like I got other stuff to do and and head out. I, like how um, how detri detrimental is that doing that over like week after week, class after class, uh, so to speak? You know, that's that's a case by case. It it can be something where depending on how somebody's exerting themselves, they yeah. can get away with it for a long time if they're not like truly pushing themselves. But if you're pushing yourself all the time, you'll start to see some kickback somewhere, yeah. whether that is, you know, maybe you're not sleeping. Maybe all of a sudden you're crabby. Maybe you are exhausted yeah. post instead of being energized post. Um, those kinds of small symptoms start to creep up. It's kind of, it's hard because like, if you've ever had like a, and, and nutrition, I talk about this with nutrition all the time. If you've ever had like a bad bout of gas, Go through your okay. car, yeah, and it feels like it's shaking, and the doors are going to fall off, and you go, "Holy crud! What is happening?" Nope, just bad gas from the gas station. The body goes through that, but 
all those symptoms that I just named could be a symptom for anything. True. Stress, you know, too long at work, all those things. So nobody ever really has is able to pinpoint where that comes from. The exact from. thing. It's hard. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, getting... It would be nice to see because you, if you go work out weights or something, you, you have to do some sort of warm, of course, and afterwards you should be doing some sort of cool down or like you said, like a two-minute long stretch on each each area. Um, another uh, subject I'd like to go into with you is uh, uh, muscle imbalances because uh, depending on the sport, especially jiu-jitsu, I mean, there's some they're pushing muscle groups definitely apply. I mean, we're doing everything, but it's, it's heavily pulling muscle groups based. Grips, pulling, and we're kind of designing the climb and pull anyways. But can we go into the subject of, of muscle balances? Because you, you have someone that would like work with like grips, and next thing you know, they get like elbow issues, and uh, just how to what muscle balances are, and, and maybe how uh, you can confront fixing those. Sure, um, a lot of that comes from I find being able to fix imbalances through like we were kind of talking about two positional ISOs, mm-hmm. or just doing opposing work. So if I am doing um, as an example, like if I'm doing like heavy grip work. I might do a lot of animal flow based work off of that too, whether that's deadlifts, whether that is uh, farmer's walks, pinch grip work, anything like that. Um, Because animal flow, like when you're doing grip work, you're working a little bit more um, your flexors as opposed to your extensors. When you're working in animal flow, your extensors are getting a lot of work in your forearms. Stuff like that, um, just working the directly opposing angle. So whatever it is, I'll have usually have some kind of, you know, if it's deadlifts, I'll do some kind of push-based core work that comes with it, if that makes sense. Gotcha, um, yeah. Something to kind of out and balance my forearms, balance my elbows. Um, or if you're doing, you know, a great thing to do after bench press would be rows. Just to kind of balance, mm-hmm. yeah, balance that out. Yeah, otherwise you see, yeah, the guys at the gym and they're just like shoulders are rolled forward. They got the big chest because mm-hmm. they're so overdeveloped. Mm-hmm. Uh, jiu-jitsu is a bit opposite. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would. I would imagine you guys need to do some some push work. Also yeah, way to balance that out. way more push work. Yeah. Uh, or you know, like I try my most uh, obviously push-ups bench press and all that but yeah. handstands you know, other other angles of that and all that kind of down the road facilitates guard passing and stuff you know all the fun the fun stuff yeah like absolutely um yeah some of animal flow actually too comes from um like some capoeira stuff yes um so you'll see some of that and some of probably the more advanced versions of animal flow like they're level two level three you'll start to see more like flipping you'll see more mm. Um, of those kinds of movements that are, that are very similar to that. Now let's take like, and this it kind of goes for any age group. Obviously, the older we get, the more kind of like rock solid and, and stiff you are. You know, it's it's less and less comfortable just doing a, a a back roll or forward roll, let alone like a flip or something or going inverted. Uh, what are some good flow uh, uh, concepts people can approach to kind of uh, break break the the blocks, so to speak, that keep you so like stiff and rigid. I find that rotation, particularly rotational stretches at joints, Hmm. um, and and there would be a lot of smarter people than I who would tell you this too, Uh, typically outside of the spine first, the spine is kind of the one place where I would start with like flexion and extension, stretching first, but every other joint, I would start with rotation, Um, particularly for the shoulders. If you want more shoulder range of motion... Even people who have like really like those forward shoulder rolls, um, you know, the shoulders pitched forward, heads pitched forward. A lot of times they're weak up front. Hmm. They're kind of tight, weak, protecting. So if you strengthen internal rotation, you might be able to access more of your external rotation and your your back extensor muscles. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and it depends on what you do every day. I mean, if you're at a desk all day and yeah. then you're driving all day I and mean, you're all in yeah. this weird position. Yes. You know, your body's actually not really designed to be doing that. No, <laughs> it's not at like, all. Not at all. No. Or even, uh, I, I like doing this. Like I got turned on this uh, years ago with even like lifting. But uh, can you kind of go into like the um, the benefits of uh, going barefoot? I love it. Yeah. If you, I mean, you've been around me enough. I don't wear shoes ever. Yeah. Um, I only wear shoes if, I, most of the time I'll wear slides, but I only wear shoes in public places where I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's feedback, right? So when you're, I use deadlifting particularly, I don't necessarily um, 
depending on your mobility, I wouldn't necessarily do it for squatting mm -hmm. because you'd have to have really good ankle mobility to do it. Yeah. Um, under load, especially. But if you're, if you're talking like deadlifting, like you're thinking your feet are what's in contact with the ground. Yeah. That's what you're putting into the ground. That's where you're generating force. You're putting force into the ground. The ground's putting force into you. If you're wearing shoes, particularly, uh, some of my mentors would call them uh, foot condoms, but like if you're wearing particularly like the padded shoes, right? That feedback from the ground to your foot is being distorted by that fabric, like that. Oh, totally. That's it's like a false floor. Exactly. Or... It's meant to redistribute all of that load to take it out of your foot. Where and then what happens is if your foot's not accepting the load it's supposed to, that that can go somewhere else. Um, but your feet are. They're they're the they're your ground. They're your yeah. they're your contact. They're your source of feedback to your surroundings. Same thing if you're on your hands. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, and we try, and especially in jujitsu, we try to get our, our our students to use their feet as much as they do hands. Like you should have like uh, monkey feet or something. You know, like you should be able to do that. And uh, obviously, we're we're barefoot out there, unless if it's like sambo or wrestling or something. But um, <clears throat> there's so much more dexterity to the feet and application. Um, so yeah, I, I love that kind of concept. And, and what are they? I know some people like to call that like caveman lifting or something. But oh yeah, but there's, but there's something uh, a little more visceral about that, a little more uh, and grounded, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a connection. I mean, I'm I I I can't, I mean, I went through Achilles uh, reconstructive surgery a few years ago, oh. um, and the idea that I could no longer like turn a doorknob with my foot bothered me. Like I yeah. would do that at home all the time, and. Um, I'm, I've obviously I've gotten that back. It's been a few years, but the 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 thought of losing that connection, like because you know you're yeah. coming out of surgery for a while, and my foot hadn't touched the ground for six months, essentially, ish. Um, but you know, not being able to touch the ground and, and yeah. having times where you you couldn't feel parts of your foot, um, I did not like that at all. <laughs> no, no, it's just well, I mean, uh, what's interesting, we don't know because we're um, sort of. I guess a good word to use is desensitized by it. But it's just the environment because, you know, we wear clothes, we got the shoes with the soles, we got, we're sitting in chairs all day, whether you're a, a student or at work or whatever. If you're not sitting in there, you're sitting in your car. You, you, like like we we're saying, like you're kind of designed to do more. And, and we're also promoting more, especially when we had to go through all that lockdown stuff. But you're promoting more to be indoors. We're more designed outdoors, the vitamin D and things like that. So uh, you almost, don't you almost see when people start, uh, let's say, start training with you uh, from whatever athlete or age or whatever, um, you know, you're kind of almost like untraining those areas. Yeah. To a degree, right? Absolutely. You have to deprogram a lot. K working with kids is way easier for that reason. There's so much less to deprogram. When you're working with somebody who's 40 years old, who's been inside sitting in a chair, you are teaching them stuff that they should have known how to do for years, but their body forgets it. Like you're, it's right. It's, I always equate it to being like, if you, you know, you get done with algebra and then the next year you're doing geometry, <laughs> but that first couple of weeks coming back from coming back into school, like you're doing the the refresher on last yeah. year and you're sitting there going, what yeah. is this? Yeah. But that's what happens to your body. Your body forgets. Literally. And then yeah. you start to, it, it comes back quickly, but you know, it's that same feeling. It's you're, you have no idea where you are in space. If you don't, yeah, if you don't do it, it just, because you do adapt to whatever. That's what's always interesting. You, the body, the, even mind and everything, you adapt to whatever. But yeah, it's so much, there's so many like, reports and high-end people studies that just shows you should be outdoors and you should be uh, more functional it's just tough because as an adult let's say you're just stuck at work because that's a priority because you got to pay bills and you got to be there but yeah it's, it's just as important and what's like a major thing you see uh, i'm sure there's a bunch but most common mistakes people when they start working out for example uh, one I noticed when they, whether it's jujitsu or people working out, is they just uh, they go like like head over heels, let's hit it, and it's like too much at once, and then next thing you know, like uh, they only associate that with like okay, this is soreness. So like you said, most of it's from the recovery. Is it, like what are some big uh, beginning, you know, getting back into working out mistakes you're seeing? Take your time. That's it. It's a process because the 
just like you said, and, and like I was talking about how your body forgets it, as soon as your body forgets it, when it comes back, like your body goes through like the cognitive learning theory. Every time you yeah. do a lift or anything like that, um, your, your brain is firing neurons to figure out what to do. Yeah. If it feels like the first time you've done something, your brain is over firing neurons. That makes sense. Yeah. And over stimulating your body. So you are going to be even, even like our warm up, which is not super arduous, but I've had high level athletes who've been off for six months. They do a warm up and they are sore from the warm up. And that is yeah. simply because it feels like novel stimulus again. So it over stimulates their body, which is what happens to beginners. They come in head over feet. They are just ungodly sore for two to three weeks. And they're like, man, it is never going to be better. And <laughs> then they just fall off the face of the earth because of that. So my encouragement is always step on the gas, step off the gas. Yeah. You, Take other, your time. Otherwise you can't like, um, in a way, like you, you'll see it down the road, but you're basically setting yourself up to fail. I mean, or, or you're going over, you have this mental hurdle and then you, you see it so much people with any type of training, uh, they, they put too much gas on. Uh, because it maybe feels good during the workout or whatever, and then they're sore as hell, and then they're like, they they have a hard time even confronting coming back, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it, like we, we talk about it with kids right now, the instant gratification stuff. Adults are no different. Yeah. Everybody shows up, yeah. and, you know, yeah. they want to be a black belt. They won. Like, yeah. if, the faster they can get there, they'll do it. And sometimes, because, yeah, you don't feel it in the moment or you don't feel something, you know, you don't feel tired, right. you feel good, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to keep pushing, which is a very admirable quality. But knowing that you don't have to kill yourself yeah. to get better and that, you know, understanding the process of a black belt, years, is not yeah. happening in two weeks. Chill out. Yeah. Or same thing with the fitness side. So, yeah. like, people, what to expect kind of going, you know, starting up, getting their conditioning up or, or working on whatever – uh, like you said, take your time. But the problem with that is there is this instant, we're in a society, it's instant gratification or instant, like, I see a result. And uh, when it comes to the body, it's not really designed for that. No, and, and you, I mean, you have nothing but advertisements that, that tell you, you know, detox for three days and you're going to, and, you know, this is going to be amazing. The body has its own way of detoxing. It's called the lymphatic system. It's yeah. your liver, it's yeah. your kidneys, it's all those things. Your body will do that. You can eat natural substances. You can, you know, eat foods that are that contain certain micronutrients that will help your body filter itself out a little bit over the course of a few mm -hmm. days. But really, all you have to do, if you really want to quote detox or do anything, stop eating crap for three days mm -hmm. and let your body do its job. Yeah, so that's all you gotta do. You don't have to take these magic pills. You don't have to go do a fast for four days or whatever these, or you know these oh, right. these ten, seven day detoxes. Yeah. And, and the reality is what happens is you lose water weight when you do these or you're losing muscle mass. So people are getting this result. Hey, I've lost a few pounds. This detox scale. must have worked. Yeah. All these toxins in my bodies. No. <laughs> no. Now on a scale, maybe it looks like that. Right. Um, or, 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 or like if you, let's say you're lifting weights for that purpose. And, or you're just uh, even lightweights. Your getting, body's getting more conditioned because there's a lot of muscle atrophy from being inactive. Uh, or sedentary and then the scale still looks uh, oh it looks the same it's not like i'm not losing but like uh, your body composition keep going into that yeah once you're you're so it's always funny when you hear somebody says muscle weighs more than fat what does it a pound of muscle and a pound of fat are the same thing right pounds pound yeah pounds pound uh, muscle is more dense than fat though so you can be smaller in stature but weigh the same as somebody who's bigger than you because right. they t if they have more fat, they just take up more space, right? Because yeah. fat takes up more space than muscle does. Um, so body comp is probably the best way you can ever find that. Um, I know like here we do body scan work. We do 3D body scans mm -hmm. um, for members here. Um, you know, and there's a, you know, give it a 3 to 5% error rate, but it gives people something. It gives right. people something to tell them like, hey, maybe you didn't lose five pounds, but your body comp changed maybe one to two percent, right? You know, and that's that's, that's a huge. big deal. Yeah, that's a huge deal. And you look different, feel different. That's the other factor. Which yeah, I've I've had this discussion. Uh, Steph and I are owner operator. Um, we've had this discussion a bunch of times. Like ultimately, like 
fitness, all of that stuff, it comes down to primal urges, right? Yeah. We can all we can all talk about and you know very much like, hey, you know, let's drop the blood pressure medication. Maybe if we're a borderline diabetic, you know, maybe we're not taking a pill to help balance blood sugar. You know, th- there's definitely all of those benefits, lowering blood cholesterol. But ultimately, everybody wants to look better in the mirror, and they want yeah. somebody to attract to them. That's what that. That's what yeah. ultimately all of this is. There is some degree of vanity somewhere. Somewhere in there. If you're not, then you think it's part of it. Yeah, and 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 that makes you feel better when you look better, which for you is good. You feel better. You start to accomplish more. It makes your day much easier when you feel better about yourself. A million percent. Yeah, you know, that's the key, and uh, and you're doing it, you know, for yourself, and maybe for your family, but you know, for yourself, it's a personal, very personal thing. Um, the other thing to go into is when you know someone's starting up because you got, but you train it everybody in between, right? Athletes or people just trying to lose some weight or there's some maybe functional things, um, you know. So there's so many categories we can go into. We could be here for a whole week. Uh, always, <laughs> but but. Uh, for the purpose of people listening, there's more like, I guess, more sports performance based, you know, martial arts, uh, things like that. We have, let's take the two sides, whether people want to compete or maybe they're just, you know, naturally doing something, you're losing some weight or and getting toned. But what's a good a way, dietarily speaking, uh, not supplements, but diets uh, speaking, let's say, let's start first with someone that's trying to just get in shape, uh, get, whether it's tone, lose some weight. And then after that, we can go into guys that are more in the, the bulking phase, I suppose. Sure. So, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, generally what the what I have seen, so this will be a little bit. So if I ramble, just go for it. it. So um, I was just talking about this with somebody yesterday, too. The world has shifted, right? What our bodies are being asked to do on a daily basis right. has changed entirely. Medieval times, people ate loaves of bread all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Because A... They were peasants. They couldn't afford chickens. They couldn't afford or meat, meat, stuff yeah. like that. But also, B, they were working in a field yeah. all day for 14 hours. You need carbohydrates. That's a foundation of energy. Yes. Right? So It's like the villain now, right? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, you know, I think about, um, you know, places in Asia where, you know, rice is a huge component huge, of the culture. Yeah. But, again, now there in major cities, people are in – offices they're working at computers yeah. they're working at desks but they're still eating a load of these grains that were that were that worked for them and they're still a very valuable source of energy yeah but typically if somebody needs to lose weight upping your protein content helps i find that yeah. here we just eat too much energy-based foods whether that is car- carbohydrates are not the enemy let me say that again yeah. because i don't want to make sure that that doesn't come out carbohydrates are not the enemy our bodies are need just, it we, we need them um but uh, people trying to lose weight generally eat because it's easier, because it's easier to process, it's easier to make in um, major manufacturing. Mm-hmm. People eat more energy-based foods, fat, carbohydrates, right. those kinds of foods. It's harder to get protein in. Um, but if you're trying to lose weight, protein is probably where you need to up it and maybe drop some of your energy base, whether that's fat and carbohydrates or fats themselves or carbohydrates themselves an athlete you need all the energy you can get right like yeah. if, like for me post workout my post workout meal will have three carbohydrates for every gram of protein so you're talking to replenish about to replenish right exercise is depletion um so carbohydrates particularly good healthy long-term starches um potatoes yeah. rice Eat it if you're an athlete. If you're competing, you, eat you need carbohydrates. Yeah. You need them. Yes, that makes that makes so much sense. And and also, uh, you know, going to the, the the bulking phase. So people are just more interested. Like they're skinny guy. They can never like break. <laughs> they can't break 150 pounds. They're trying to get up to like 190 or something. Um, obviously, you don't want to load up on on, on a bunch of butter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, for them, just uh, you kind of go into that with whether it's the you know the proteins and things like that. More carbohydrates. Yeah, yeah. Mass equals energy, right? That that famous E equals MC squared, that famous yeah. Einstein stuff, mass equals energy. If you want more mass, and and I'm oversimplifying this greatly sometimes. For sure, yeah. Degree. But um, the law of thermodynamics, if you want more mass, you need more energy. So more energy-based foods. So um, higher pro, you know, high protein content uh, you need for muscle recovery, certainly mm-hmm. if you're working out. Um, but you also need a lot 
of carbohydrates because yeah. you need to store energy in your muscles. Those muscles, right. especially like you're like I was talking about with my three to one ratio post workout. Mm-hmm. That's usually within a half hour of my workout. Yeah, it's like a win- It's a window. It's a window of time, right? When you're done working out, when you when those carbohydrates will be stored in your muscle as muscle glycogen, and then they get used for things like your next workout or breaking down your proteins to use for cell reconstruction. Okay, that all requires energy. Everything in your body is energy based we are literally just a ball of energy yeah. that's all we are yeah yeah i, I think uh that's such an interesting point because there's two sides of that and real quick i know like uh water obviously water intake is so important but there's a such thing as like if you have to say get this super like purified water it's very clean uh you kind of go into minerals and electrolytes because I, I feel like a lot of people are, are kind of pounding water down good they'll bring the gallon around where, with them wherever they go but there's a, there isn't there like an issue if it's just water your body like you said with protein earlier you can only absorb so much uh and i believe uh, electrolytes and minerals are, are a major factor major factor and i mean a lot of times um i will tell you i drink our tap I mean, we're, we're very lucky out here where we live yeah our water's great um, so I don't drink filtered water yeah. um, because of that very reason. The filters take out essential minerals that come from the water. That's how even our ancestors got a lot of micronutrients was drinking water in its natural state. Obviously for them, super dangerous. That's, right. why, that's why alcohol became a thing because water wasn't right. safe. But now we're not at that point. So if you're, if you're drinking water, a lot of times I would tell people to add some salt. Um, whether that's Celtic sea salt, mm-hmm. um, whether that's Himalayan sea salt, anything like that. I wouldn't necessarily just use random table salt. Right. Um, okay. But yes, minerals are a huge part. I find in dehydration, most people, um, a lot of people will you know, say eat a banana. That's the old school thought process. A lot of times I find that salt is your better of the, of the electrolytes. You're better of the electrolytes because it helps to balance you, right? Your body's always looking, like you mentioned earlier, homeostasis. Your yeah. body is always looking for the balance, that salinity balance yeah, yeah. in your body. That salt water, it's looking for that perfect part where you get enough salt and enough water. So typically, yeah, you, you need them. I mean, even if you need like, uh, you're like super, super dehydrated, they do an IV leak. What is that? Yeah. Potassium, sodium. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, it proofs in the pudding there as well. Absolutely. Medically. Yeah. Uh, I, I do see some athletes, they, they work out, so especially like UFC guys, they work out so hard. Uh, they were able to do IV leaks as their, their workouts. So that's the quickest way to replenish. Sure. I think at some point they consider like, well, our needle's involved and uh, you can't do that. But like the quickest way to rehydrate is is that. That's is why that? doctors do that for a reason. Yeah. I mean, and something else too, if you, I mean, if you don't have that access, like I said, put salt in your water, but then also when you take sips of water, start swishing it around your mouth because yeah. you'll start to take some stuff in through your gums. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can say that I've, I've been through enough, been on, I've been fortunate enough to deal with some, di- unfortunate enough to deal with some diabetic emergencies in my oh, life. Wow. Not me personally, but other people that um, I cared about and you got to do sometimes you got to take like sugar and just rub it on their gums to get them back up or orange juice right in the mouth to try to get it. Well, it's absorbent, right? Exactly. It absorbs right away. Yep. Man, that's crazy. Uh, but it works. It was what the body does. Yeah. It's a very measurable thing. Yeah. Yeah, So actually speaking of that too, there's a new, uh, it might be a Gen Z thing. I don't know, but it's uh, a new thing where people take like protein powder or all that stuff and they just, they just eat the powder. And I did see like some sit of in their mouth because they're trying to absorb it through their gums. So the same kind of thought <laughs> process. It, I saw somebody do it once. I thought it was hilarious. I definitely get it. I don't know that I'll ever do something like that, yeah. but it cracked <laughs> me up. Well, basically, what you're saying if we see someone do that, they're not necessarily like a, an addict. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so wild. It, uh, uh, let's go to another subject because uh, I'm sure, uh, this, especially dealing with a lot of athletes and a lot of people listening, there's injuries. And uh, everything we kind of did was like injury prevention and how to perform well and, and things like that. But let's say you get an injury. I, it, of course, it depends on the injury and it's just uh, part and parcel with it. Uh, what about like working around injuries and things like that? Can you kind of go into like, okay, this guy hurt his knee or hurt his elbow? Um, pending, you can still do movement, of course. Uh, what would you focus or have someone that's kind of down and out on one side and maybe their elbow hurts? Uh, what can you work with? 
Um, I mean, you can work with whatever works essentially, yeah. right? So you you know if if their elbow hurts pulling, but it doesn't hurt pressing, you can work pressing, yeah. um, and then you can stretch kind of the pulling muscles later. That might be something you need to do where you might need to stretch out if it's muscular, if it's um, again, yeah, it depends on the injury without a doubt. What but is, if yeah. somebody's if somebody's back hurts, a lot of times I don't shy away from it. I go yeah. after it because it's typically something where um, either muscular, obviously assuming it's not something structural, um, that, you know, planks, stuff like yeah, that, like, like light or, or core squeezes, things like that to help the area feel supported. Um, those are, are similar things, you know, working on good mechanics, whether that's if, if you want to squat, but somebody's back hurts, yeah. maybe you just have them do body weight and you have them do what I would call like a total body tension squat where you try to squeeze your body as hard as you can. You're not going to use any extra load and you're just going to slowly work your mechanics. You're going to go down to the lowest point of no pain. Yeah. And then you work through that range of motion down slow, up slow, you know, manipulating counts, manipulating uh, pauses, yeah. stuff like that to get into positions where stuff doesn't hurt. Um, again, ISOs, holds, mm -hmm. positional isometrics, um, anything like that, that obviously does not f cause pain. If they feel right. pain while they're doing it, it is an absolute hard no. Right. A uh, yeah, million percent. Yeah. And, and, and especially uh, with jujitsu, you know, whether we're on top or bottom or whatever, there's, there's a lot of like hunched over, kind of crunched vibe. And uh, you hear so many guys, uh, you know, whether it's hip or knee issues, but back issues. But the spine, like especially the lumbar, it's, it's more curved like inwards, like upwards towards the belly, but back of the belly button. And um, you can kind of go into that, I guess, like, as far as muscle imbalances or, or, or overuse. Um, so like, so like a good exercise would be to strengthen the back, I guess, in that example, and stretch uh, the front if you're so hunched. Or going to like uh, how people can pinpoint like, oh, my back's bothering me. Sure. So if it's if we're talking if it's muscular, so I'll go on the, the yeah. assumption that we're talking about muscle, muscle issues. Yeah. So typically, what I find is somebody who feels pain um, in an area, I find that that area is typically being overstretched. Very gotcha. rarely, unless it's like a cramp from somebody contracting. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do I find somebody in pain while a muscle is. Contract. Contract. Okay. Right. So the so if you're crunched, yeah, that low back. If you're probably. crunched, and then your lower back's tight, typically maybe it's being stretched too far. So a lot of times, what I'll do there is I'll work um, isos, obviously both directions. Right. Okay. So I will work going forwards, but I'll also work going backwards and trying to get you know the area quote unquote stimulated or what I would call reset. Right. Try to get gotcha. the, okay, try yeah. to get something back to functioning how it's supposed to. Um, Restimulating, I would call it. You know, we would say the antagonist. We would call it, or the agonist. We would call it the yeah protagonist. Excuse me. I'm trying to get my terms back. It's been a long <laughs> time. But you know, just opposing muscles. Um, what you want to work and what is supposed to oppose it directly, you get those things firing like they're supposed to again. Yeah. Typically you'll find some degree of relief. Okay, cool. And, and yeah, something good for the guys to uh, look at because there's some common injuries. <clears throat> I mean, there's so many different things. There's like, you know, wrists or whatever, jo uh, joints in, in the fingers. Now, <clears throat> in martial arts and in particular grappling, especially jujitsu, is a very joint, uh, unfriendly art. And uh, <laughs> what are some good things people can do for their joints, whether it's, <clears throat> I don't know, whether it's uh, also a supplement side, like a glucosamine chondroitin kind of thing, or more towards like, uh, you know, icing it or stretches or muscle, you know, can you kind of go into some tips for you guys? Sure. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll start with the supplements. I think things like glucosamine and chondroitin. Mm. I think things like fish oil. I think things yeah. like, um, you can, depending on your belief structure, non THC or THC based CBD stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, um, that's big. Those are anti-inflammatories. Um, those things tend to help. Um, Arnica cream is something that oh, yeah. is fantastic. That is a, um, a compound that I know nurses use. <laughs> Um, and it is, it's easy access on shelves. Um, I use that myself sometimes. Biofreeze is something you can use. I, I am not somebody who necessarily does heat 
Mm -hmm. only because I find that um, two things. If it's muscular and you're heating an area, um, you're bringing inflammation, which is good. But if it's not contrasted and taken away, you can get some blood pooling, <laughs> cause more inflammation, cause oh. more pain. Or if you're lucky and you don't feel any pain, sometimes it makes people feel too good. And then they try to get back to something sooner than they should. And then you're, you oh. start to get into <clears throat> injury. So I always typically will tell people ice yeah. because you're not going to get done with icing something and be like, ah, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm good to go a hundred percent. Like, you know, like yeah. I've never seen somebody step on the gas full speed after icing. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, cause it's going to give the, the body that time to rest, recoup and regenerate itself. Yeah. And that makes so much sense. <clears throat> it has so much application too, whether it's ice baths or, or just, yeah, putting a pack on that area or yeah. compression with it. Um, yeah. And then like some people going into, um, you know, whether it's, they're interested in competition or just just training in general there's different kind of focal points <clears throat> as far as uh how to prep up for that so generally speaking for athlete whether it's martial arts or football or whatever um what's a general kind of game plan uh good for people uh fitness wise going into that i have never met somebody who could not benefit from being more explosive yeah. So no matter what we're doing in training, and, and some of that is like I've worked with some of your guys yeah. a little bit, helping them prep for their last competition. Yeah. And some of them asked me for different stuff. A couple of them asked me for conditioning. A couple of them asked me for strength. So there's different – you, you try, to, try to give the client kind of what they want a little bit too and right. see what they need. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's all sport-specific. But to some degree, I will always have something explosive mm -hmm. in everything because I have never met somebody where doing something quicker does not help them in their <laughs> yeah. sport. Yeah, but I've, I've just I've never seen that. So if somebody if somebody has seen that, I'm all ears. But I have never seen that. So That's even if you're doing light work, um, you know, somebody who's not looking, you know, for doing deadlift work, and somebody's not looking to, you know, set a world record in deadlifts. Right. I get that because that's not what you're here for. You're you're not here to deadlift. You are here to get better for your sport. So if it's somebody where we need to keep their load down a little bit, we'll just work speed, force in the ground, mm -hmm. fast, simulate maybe not a jump, but try to use jump like effort. That kind of speed, yeah, intent matters in everything yeah. you do. Yeah, that that makes so much sense. Yeah, because no matter what you say or do, whether you, you consider yourself an athlete or not, you're doing athletic movements either way, and. Um, and that explosiveness. What about uh, conditioning or cardio specifically? I, I, it pertains per sport. Right? You have like an aerobic thing, so you're gonna you run uh, three miles, and you're gonna do some anaerobic, and like a forty yard dash. Can you go uh, people like the differences between those two concepts? Like, and let's apply that like a jujitsu match, for example, is like a five minute round on, on, on average, right? Uh, can you kind of go into that mentality of like conditioning the, the heart and lungs there? Yeah. So I think that for, so for me, in terms of how I have trained everybody, I find anaerobic conditioning to be within, within reason. Obviously you can't push somebody to, to death, right. but I find anaerobic conditioning to really help aerobic conditioning. Um, so with, with your guys as an example, um, you know, we were doing, I would call it, it's not true Tabata. It's Tabata style, meaning mm -hmm. like 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest, um, you know, to try to help them for, you know, maybe four rounds of something yeah. and try to get them through that kind of load, a little bit of recovery, then go, a little bit of recovery, go, and yeah. then give them big breaks when they're done with stuff for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, also... You know, the other way, switching your ratios up where you're going maybe 10 seconds at max effort and you take 20 to 30 seconds rest and then continue to do that round after round after round. You are building some degree of conditioning. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. But incrementally, right? So you start work through different phases, maybe shorter right. duration, longer rest. And then eventually you start to work for a longer duration, shorter rest. Because your body's adapted, right? And, yeah. and with that, probably the movements you're using need to change also. So if you're okay, using, yeah. if we're doing shorter duration, uh, longer rest, we can do something more demanding, more explosive. If you're doing something longer duration, shorter rest, it's going to need to be something that where the movement itself isn't intense, 
the duration is the intensity, right? Yeah. Shorter duration, the movement can be intense because it's short duration. So you you can do that. So you kind of have to work your way through that. I would call it those phases. And like you said, it takes time to build up too. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you see a lot of guys will like jog or bike, and they do like a like a five k or, or something of that nature, like long distance, and that's very healthy. It's aerobic. It's reoxygenating you. It's just good, like recovery day or something of that nature. Yeah. But uh, if they're only focusing on that for their conditioning, and you see them come into like an athletic five minute round thing, man, they're getting gassed out. Yeah. Well, I mean, at four minutes and thirty seconds yeah. in a round you still need to move quickly because you're competing against somebody, right? Yeah. So so that's why for me, and, and especially in terms of like sports like that, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, somebody who's training for a marathon or training for a triathlon, that's a little different. Their movement-based stuff comes for what I would say, as you were talking about earlier, more injury prevention yeah. and more movement diversity because they're – they're so repetitive in their movements. They don't do anything else. Like, you know, yeah. jogging, stuff like that. It's it's small range of motion, and it's very simple movement. It's nothing else. So we train them for what I would call movement diversity. With somebody who's doing a combat sport like jiu-jitsu or martial arts, you have movement diversity because yeah. you have to do it to execute anything you yeah. just do. So for us, it's just conditioning movement diversity. And and explosively, quickly, you you are gonna have to outcompete somebody at the four minute forty five second mark. Right. You know, like you still have to be able to move. Maybe not what you were doing at you know at at Bell, but close to what you were your capabilities were at Bell. Yeah, right? that's a totally different game than somebody running a five k. A million percent, and but I think that's the, that mindset to that approach to training uh, is an important thing for guys to hear because otherwise uh, you just you, you like do a five minute hard round, which is I mean it's got its merit. It just, I, I always compare it to like if you're going to max lift, you're not going to max lift back to back days. You're not doing that. Right. <clears throat> Same thing. You you shouldn't be max sparring or whatnot back to back days. Right. There's still a way to do be on the mats every day. Um, sometimes several times a day. But uh, yeah, you have to have that that balance, and it like you said earlier, I think it's a good takeaway. Is uh, you know guys need to build up to it. I think they bite off more than they can chew. For whatever reason, maybe that's how they kind of came up, and now we're like older, or whatever the case. But yeah, that that build up and being well rounded. Yeah, we I find that typically early on, um, we can do the shorter duration, more intense stuff mm-hmm. um, for more rounds early on, and then we gradually. <clears throat> decrease rounds and we increase duration um, for them as kind of like a buildup. And then they've already got that explosive work. And all we've done is like, so for 10 seconds, you you work explosively at a certain range of motion at a certain speed. Okay, now we push it to 20 seconds. Yeah. Okay, now at 20 seconds, can you maintain that? Sure. Okay, boom. You're doing that same motion, your same movement for 20 seconds. Now we move to 30 seconds. Then we move to 45. Then you start to move to a minute. But obviously with that comes bigger rest times for them too. Of course, <clears throat> and you can kind of as we're wrapping up here, going to uh, uh, train yourself for peak performance. So there's a big subject with that now. And now for sports teams, obviously it's seasonal. Uh, there's some, to a degree seasonal jujitsu. It's technically like you can go year round co- competition wise, but between matches or, or professional like UFC fighters would be like you know X amount of months between each. You know they'll they'll fight two or three times a year, uh, so you can peak uh train for that but guys that are kind of training uh for like let's say a summer and then like a, a fall uh competition kind of go into that concept of training for peak performance yeah i mean you're so uh, i use that but also use like marathon training as an example too mm-hmm. um when you're training for a marathon um and you and you look at programming and stuff like that that'll happen for it you're going to accumulate, get to a point where you're accumulating over 26 miles a week. You're not running a marathon before the marathon. Right. The marathon is the performance. So you're not going to be practicing marathons. You shouldn't be. You should be working on maybe a few days a week, accumulating that mileage, and then working faster. Because again, your, your goal, once you can do 26 miles, if you can run 13 and or so miles, you can run 26. You can get right. your way through it. But you want to start to work on getting faster so that that 26.2 goes faster. 
Right. Same concept for for a fight. You want to you want to get to a point where you're optim, you're op, yeah, and it could be, um, you know, bodybuilding too. Same thing. You're you're working to a specific show to an optimal level of physique, whatever that is, but you can't live there. You right. can't live in that state. <clears throat> right. You have to back down because it's it's a nightmare to try to stay in those states. And, and, and there's, yeah, there's so much. To, it's not as you're unnatural and all that too. And it, to build up to that and then do the performance. And another thing I see people do, <clears throat> especially the week of, they try to like, oh, I want to go to this weight class. And, they, and then they just start, or they just start changing their diet or the way they train. Like, especially like when it's, it, when it's, prep for peak performance like you just mentioned we're in the zone we'll back off after the performance but like you can't change no. keep going to that yeah so actually i will give you a little bit of a family story so my oh. my great grandfather's name is frankie conley um he was out of the record books for a long time but he is thought to be Ital- italy's first world champion at the bantamweight level oh wow and Man. he uh yeah like 19 you know in the teens yeah we're talking um early 1900s he fought um, he, you know, you, you, and back then, I think he is quoted as saying the true measure of a fighter is, is like a 45 round fight. That's what he believed. Wow. It was boxing, right? It was boxing. Yeah. And he would run from Kenosha to Racine and back on the beach every yeah. day. That was his warm up. Wow. Yeah. So Jeez. he, he wins the world title. He has a couple defenses and then, um, he loses the title, but he lost the title and supposedly, to what I understand, he had been trying to lose weight to make weight, oh. and he hadn't eaten for like three or four days. Wow! And you know, it, or eaten minimally for three or four days, and the fatigue level. He just, I mean, you're That's talking insane. about fighting at the highest level. How could you possibly, basically, That's fight with one arm tied behind your back? Yeah, they literally. That's yeah. what you're doing. You know what I mean? So if you if you are trying to change something at the last minute whether that would be going up in a weight class yeah you've you've been training at a strength level to handle and move your body explosively at a certain weight if you added weight to that you're not going to move as fast yeah. if you if you're trying to lose weight you don't have the energy to move as fast as you've been training yourself for so wow, you're that's interesting, though. basically throwing a whole wrench in all of your plans. That's crazy. Doing that. yeah. That's crazy. And, and, and not just uh, uh, going up and down weight class, but just just the week of, and you're in this, you're ready for that weight class. Like, yeah, that applies too. Like guys are like, I'm going to start eating uh, yeah. perfectly here. It's like, what, do what, you, what you've been doing that's got you in the zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go go with, what is, what's the famous saying? Dance with the girl that brought you? Just go yeah. with it. I yeah, mean, you'd like that's at that point. I mean, you're you're talking about at the, such the highest level. You need to not be thinking at right. all, right? No yeah. matter what you're doing, everything needs to be reaction. When you're competing, it needs to be reaction. So if you're changing something and you're yeah. no longer reacting and you're thinking, you're automatically slower. You're automatically putting yourself behind, it's right? At up. some level of competition, regardless of what that is. If you're not prepared, right? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And then obviously, I, once you got to the competition, then you, you said you have that come down period where you kind of like recouping off because you can't live in that no that space. It's, it's it's a it's yeah it's not sustainable. Like living at the like I remember um, when I was doing nutrition work, I was reading research and. Um, some of the research were coming out like the difference. But so like when I, when I work with new people, nutrition wise, we talk about like basically 80, 20 living in the 80%, um, eating well, give yourself 20% enjoy life. Right. Right. And part of the reason that that has become such a fad, right. That right. has become huge. You hear 80, 20 all the time. I hear it from all sorts of people. I mean, maybe, maybe general pop doesn't hear it as much as I do, but I hear, hear it from it everybody. Time. I do. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is because research will tell you eating well 90% of the time or more, the results are not that much greater than eating well at 80%. And eating at 80% is way more sustainable than being oh, yeah. perfect all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Right? It just is. That, uh, that's the 100% of the 80%. Exactly. Right? <laughs> like it's, 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 it's super bizarre because it seems counterintuitive. Yeah. But the reality is you're in a much better headspace. 
you're in a much better i mean like because food nutrition that's all cultural too right yeah oh yeah so, sure yeah you know going out to dinner and having dinner with family like yeah you know i'm just gonna have my my salad and my you know plain chicken or my you know i'm just gonna eat my egg whites and you know right. some celery like that that's not sustainable no it's not it's for not some people it is you know there are exceptions and it's cultural but, cultural and uh, and there's other side of this too where um like a common thing now with like intermittent fasting and things like that sure. but like anything else you, whatever new thing you, you get adapted to it first sure that's part of you preparing that's not you're not doing that like when you're within that month of peak right uh, performance yeah if you're if if that is something that has been your lifestyle and it works for you and you perform well then there's like a, with nutrition too like there's there's no system that i will tell you does not work yeah Everything works as long as it works for you. As right. long as you can do it. 100%, yeah. If you can go vegan, go vegan. If you can live that life for the rest of your life, go for it. If you can go carnivore, go carnivore. Enjoy. Yeah. But if you can't, why would you? Yeah, you're fighting yourself uh, along the Bingo. way. Bingo. Intermittent fasting is the same way. I run into people all the time who talk about that. And, um, you know... For lack of a better term, until the, what, the 1940s, post-World War II, the whole world, outside of, like, rich people, they were starving. Peasants were always yeah. starving, right? So now we have excess food. Um, so, you know, not eating for a little bit is not going to kill you. Right. But if you don't like it, if it drives you nuts, if it makes you crabby, then, right. you know, don't Maybe do it. it's not for you. That's why there's so many diets that work for so many people. Right. It's not like the one perfect diet. Uh, you know, I, I always see, you know, unless the closest I, I found, uh, not just like, uh, generationally, I suppose, like it's pretty much the way your grandparents were telling you how to eat. That's, you know, pretty much the yeah. like, cleanest, most even keeled way to go. Yeah. Cause when were your grandparents born? Yeah. Yeah. They're in the thirties. Right. 1930s. So my, in, in mine, you know, mine, you know, twenties, thirties, right. So they, they were all starving. They ate, they all made, and, and, um, there's a great documentary on, on food prep in America and post World War II, all the meals, those military meals were brought back. Those were all made to be TV dinners, right? So that's oh, when that whole fat started. Yeah. So pre World War II, the average family was cooking for 90 minutes at dinner. We are wow. now down to under a half hour oh, of yeah. meal prep yeah. for dinner now. For dinner, yeah. Which that tells you all you need to know about the quality of food and the nutrients, right? The way you cook it, like that, that messes with it to a degree yeah. or at, you know, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, just how things have switched so much, but yeah, you kind of get, got to get back to the, the grassroots of everything, yep. you know, back the, to it. The closer you get to a food's original source, the better you are. If yeah. you're eating something out of a bag or box, the easy rule yep. is three ingredients or less. If it's got more than three, there's something in it. That doesn't need to be in there, and, and not just that, but just too complex for not just the body to break down. There's there's a bit of that, yeah. but like to absorb. Yep. We talk about like uh, supplements and, and just food in general. Your body has. I can eat all the uh, lean chicken breasts in the world because the this uh, I don't know Hugh Jackman got in Wolverine shape because he ate uh, a slew of chickens. But like uh, he's developed to a point where he can absorb that much protein and intake, whereas if someone's just starting out. Uh, that's that's just way too much matter. But I'm glad you brought that up too. I'm glad you brought up Hugh Jackman because that's hilarious. That that story, like that that when he popped out of that water tank, like when we oh, were yeah. going back to what we were talking about yeah. earlier, that was peak performance. He does yeah. not look like that all the time. Exactly. That was he got he looked like that for that scene yes. for that movie. That's why he that's why he got himself to where he was. I believe there's a I, I've heard stories. I don't know that they're true, but. That he he was dehydrated, like uh, crazy. Yeah, for that I know. Scene. I know for that scene, definitely. I know for like uh, the Wolverine one, because uh, he, he did uh, Les Mis, yeah, uh, yeah, Les yeah. Robles, and he learned how to do water weight cutting, which oh, yeah, you yeah, see, yeah, okay. like you're getting headaches. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. Another, but even there, you don't maintain that, right? You can't, and and that's like the same thing too. Like for you guys, you know, you're coming up to competition. Yeah, there's ways to manipulate your body with water and manipulate right. your weight to make weight. You know, make weight at your weigh in, and then. Right. You come back, you probably gain a few pounds afterwards. There's a way to manipulate water safely, you know, but, um, but yeah, that, that goes back to that. He can't live like that. No. And also the depletion of, uh, 
not just water, but glycogen stores, yeah. right? That's a, a major yeah. factor of people. Yep. You, you shut down your sugar stuff. And then um, I know an old school bodybuilder trick. I don't know if they do it anymore, but they used to take like jelly and like rub it on their gums right before they'd walk on stage because then it would make their veins pop. Oh, really? That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you got, it gives, gives you the, the vein look. You know? Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. I mean, the you know, that's your, yeah, you look like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything, it starts to show, right? You see everything. Getting yourself dehydrated like that will show all right. those small well, I little think you said he learned a dehydrate technique from the bodybuilding side of uh, uh, yeah, that stuff. Absolutely. But, uh, hey, man, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking about this. I think we've got a lot of good info for the guys, uh, different game plans and, and different levels. People may have been doing something for a while and want sure. to switch something up or people just trying to get into it. Uh, I think this is uh, definitely a good foothold for them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Happy to help. Glad yeah. you made it. Yeah, anytime, man. Well, until the next show, guys, keep training. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Warrior's Edge podcast. For more great talks and interviews on all things martial arts, be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're ever in our area, you're welcome to come in and train with us at our academy, Olympus Grappling Arts. Until the next one, keep listening and keep training.